Hello, my name is Angie Spence, Assistant Director for Community Health Services. We would like to thank you for attending this year's Big Hearts for Seniors event. We would also like to sincerely thank you for your donations and continued support. Please enjoy today's event. My name is Dr. Theodore Saad, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Big Hearts for Seniors event, uh, which raises funds for various uh, geriatric community programs. And uh, we, of course, are needing to do things a bit differently this year. Nevertheless, we hope you enjoy uh, tonight's event uh, with uh, storytellers and uh, wonderful stories that they will be uh, sharing with you. So uh, on behalf of uh, our patients and their families, uh, the staff uh, of the University of Michigan Geriatric Clinics, we welcome you to tonight's event and uh, thank you for your continued support. And now, it's showtime. Here's your host, all the way from the University of Michigan, Dr. Vic Strecker. Hi, how are you everyone? I hope everyone is having a good time. I hope you're all relaxed at this amazing show. I hope you're dressed up to the nines and I hope you're having a glass of bubbly or something else and really enjoying yourself because this is the event of the season. I just want to tell you, this is an amazing event. I know it's online and you might have your bunny slippers on. That's okay. No problem. I do. But hey, I'm going to start out with a little five minute story just to begin this because it really relates to me anyway, to the reason why we're all here. Last night I was with my wife, my brother, my sister and my mother celebrating my dad's 89th birthday. Here's a picture of him 60 years ago as he and my mom were taking us to Southeast Asia for a year where he was starting to do research there. I'm the kid at the top with my head on his heart. Earlier this year, that heart started failing him and he suffered two major heart attacks. The University of Michigan Medical Center actually gave him new stents and gave him his 89th birthday that we had last night. So I'm deeply grateful to the University of Michigan and the Medical Center for everything they did. You know, I like to put on my wallpaper of my smartphone the things that matter most to me. And, you know, what matters most to me gives me direction and purpose. And my mom and dad mean a great deal to me. Our older adults mean a great deal to all of us. They give us a purpose for living. And this is an evening when we can become purposeful, when we can give back to them. So I wanna thank everyone for being here and coming out to support Big Hearts for Seniors. It's really gonna be a wonderful event. This is an evening of storytelling and a virtual silent auction that runs through August the 7th. Now, by the way, this is pretty new. I don't know of any other group that has run a, a program like this that's online. It's challenging. There are a lot of people helping to support this, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. But really, we've had an amazing group of supporters, and already we've had so much support from you. There are over 750 households from 27 states, including Puerto Rico, and there also we have six countries represented as well. Uh, they've all registered for this event. That is a very big event for Big Hearts for Seniors. So really, I hope all of you will pick up a little champagne and toast to that. That's just amazing. Also, you know, from the registrants, we've had about $11,000 that's been donated. From the sponsors, we've had another large amount of money. And then from the auction, we already have had some money coming in. So overall, right now, so far, we have a little more than $50,000 that's been donated. What's our goal? Our goal this year, and it's a very needed goal, is $100,000. So we need $50,000 more. And I hope this evening will not only be a, a way to share these amazing stories from amazing people, but also to point out just how unbelievably important these programs are, and they're more important than ever now. So let's talk about three ways to donate. There are three ways to donate in this program. There is a donation link, and that link is on the website. 
So that's just going to run across. You see at the bottom, there's that link that's going across. You can That's the easiest way to do this. Just pop on that donation link and donate some money. Donate what you can. Donate what you can possibly afford because this is a time to transcend, to do what you can to help all of these other people in so much need right now. The second is if you have an iPhone, you can turn it to the camera mode and simply hold it up to the screen. This icon that you see, that funny looking icon on the left, just hold it right up to the screen in camera mode and it should automatically give you a link right away to donate. That makes it easy too. So number one is a donation link. Number two is if you have an iPhone, just put it in camera mode and put it right up to the screen. Now, if you have an Android phone, then you need a what's called a QR or a quick response app. And you can download the app if you want. Maybe you already have the app. Um, and you can hold that up to the screen and it'll automatically send you to this donation site too. So that's number two. And then number three is the old fashioned way. And that is mailing us a check. And that's really easy too, because there's an address uh, on the donation link on the website. There's a simple address you can make your check out to. So, We'd like to thank all of our sponsors for supporting this very unique event, this virtual event program. And by the way, all of the sponsors are highlighted in the virtual event program that you received with your confirmation. We also wanna give a shout out to two organizations that really have helped us a great deal. Number one is Humana. Humana underwrote the technology for this virtual event. And there's a lot of technology in this. There's a lot of people to thank for that. And Humana underwrote the technology. So thank you so much, Humana. And then the second is Memory Lane for Assisted Living. You just saw a video from them. They are the presenting sponsor. They've been with us since the inception of our 2020 event when, you know, before COVID-19, they were going to sponsor the in-person, in-house event. And, uh, you know, then suddenly everything had to change and they just continued their support. As we had to move into this virtual online support system, they said, absolutely, we are going to be the presenting sponsor. So thank you, Memory Lane Assisted Living. It's been awesome. Now we have a very special message from these very special directors of these five Big Hearts for Seniors program. On behalf of Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels, the Housing Bureau for Seniors, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, Silver Club Memory Programs, and Turner Senior Wellness Program, we want to thank you for joining our virtual Big Hearts for Seniors fundraiser this year. While many components of our program and operations have changed over the past few months due to COVID-19, one thing that has remained constant has been our dedication to our community and those that we serve. We remain steadfast in our commitment to ensuring that older adults continue to receive nutritious food, housing support, opportunities to engage in educational events, supportive respite care, and wellness programs. Your support tonight helps to ensure that this will continue to be possible. While we continue to show up for those we serve, we are grateful that you have showed up tonight in support of our programs and the work that we do.
Thank you so much. Wow. And you know what? We missed Jennifer Howard in there. And so, Jennifer, would you like to uh, talk about your program? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, this is this is live, of course. Um, just wanted to say, as we tune in from our respective homes around the world, we are thrilled to present to you Big Hearted Stories, Experiences on Aging. Thank you so much, Jen. That's wonderful. And by the way, you know, one thing about this kind of program, there will be mistakes. We promise that, you know, things will happen in this because this is technology and things go wrong and it's funny and it's not as easy as doing it the other, the old fashioned way. So we're going to have fun and I hope you guys all can roll with this and every once in a while grab a little adult beverage and enjoy yourselves. I certainly am going to. So tonight, is an opportunity for people to tell their stories and to celebrate the experiences of aging. And I know a lot of people think, oh, aging, it's, you know, it's so hard and it's nothing but bad things. It's not. And as these storytellers will talk about, there's so much beauty in aging as well. And we hope to bring that out tonight. So to do that, we sent out an invitation for people to send us their stories. This is well in advance of this program. And we received a massive response. And then a panel of judges selected six storytellers to tell their own true story. This is very difficult to choose, by the way. There are a lot of amazing stories to choose from, really tough competition. This is a Kentucky Derby of storytelling. So we've got some really, really great storytellers in this. Each storyteller was asked to provide a photo that represented their story. So that photo will show up in each of the stories. It's really beautiful. We, we recorded every one of the stories, except one, which we'll get to in just a second, in an empty con auditorium. Remember, at, at the University of Michigan, you drive by on Huron, you see this building that looks like the shape of a Pringle can. That's a con auditorium. So people uh, told the story there, but totally socially distant, distanced. So masks were worn by everybody, except for the storytellers, of course. Uh, and the storytellers couldn't tell how things were going. Can you imagine being a storyteller and being video during this? And you have no idea. Everyone's staring at you with a mask over their face. That's tough. So these storytellers had the most, like, you know, that's, that's a high bar. They had a high bar to jump over. So we also, they couldn't get any read from the audience. They also couldn't get any applause, of course, because it was all just being videotaped. And I know that you might not be able to applaud, although of course you might want to, that's cool. If you want to go ahead and applaud at your home. Uh, but please, if you want, let us know whether you liked the story by using the chat feature. You can pop in just a way to go, or you know, how about this, or it reminded me of this. So use the chat feature, let's share, let's be a community all together. Even though it's a virtual community, let's be a community this evening, okay? Now again, three ways to donate. There's the donation link, there's that special QR code, which you see on the left side of your screen right now. And on your iPhone, you can just hold the camera app on your iPhone up to the icon, and it should just automatically connect and send you to uh, the donation site. Or if you have an Android, it requires a QR scanner app. Um, and number three, you can just send a check by mail to the um, address uh, on, on the website. So also, by the way, Remember, there is a silent auction too, and that's going on until August 7th. All right, so I'd like to kick this off a little bit. My wife and I have talked about what we would like to give to this. And I wanna make sure you know, you can donate any time during this show, okay? You can donate during a storyteller. You can donate right after. You can donate while I'm blabbing all the time. You can donate whenever you want, okay? It's important to think about that donation in those three different ways, wherever you're gonna do it. But I wanna say this, my wife and I would like to get that rolling, okay? So we're gonna match the next $5,000 that comes in. So Jerry and I are going to match the next $5,000 that comes in. So you're going to double your money, okay? So from all of this, we hope we're going to just kick off everything and get $10,000 more. We want to blow the doors off what we have ever done in the past because you know what? We need it. These big hearts need it more than ever right now. There's no better time. There's no better group, in my opinion, that you could donate to. Now let's start off with the first storyteller. Let me introduce storyteller number one, Roger Parker. 
Roger grew up on a farm near Ann Arbor listening to his grandfather's stories. And by the way, he's been a United Methodist preacher for 40 years. So he knows how to tell stories, right? Roger is a musician and he's played piano in dance bands and in jazz ensembles since he was a teenager. And this is a story about his musical partnership with his close friend, Ed Cox. So here's Roger Parker. His story is titled Salt and Pepper. I met Ed Cox in an ensemble class at the Nashville Jazz Workshop. He was playing tenor sax and I was on the piano. And we were by far the oldest members of that ensemble. I was 71, Ed was 92. And of course, being the oldest people there, we were the ones who always got there early. So here we are with our instruments, waiting for everybody else. What do we do? Begin to play something. Ed would begin to play some tune and I would recognize it and join right in. I'd start some tune and he'd play a jazz lick with it. I commented, Ed, you and I could be an ensemble all by ourselves. Well, he jumped on that like a goose on a worm. He said, let's do it. I said, well, yes, let's do it. And before I knew it, we were an ensemble, a duo, playing uh, the nursing home circuit. And we were well received. We were very popular because we were their kind of people playing their kind of music. But more than that, Ed, Ed was one who always wanted to make, not just make music, but to make friends. And he would make a connection. And I was always amazed, always amazed when, when he would look out there over a group and find somebody that looked like they didn't come from around here, try to figure out where they came from. And then he'd greet them in their own native language. He was making friends. It wasn't long before Ed decided that our group needed a name. He said, I think we should be called Salt and Pepper. He said, I'll be Salt, you be Pepper. And so we began to introduce ourselves as that spicy musical aggregation, Salt and Pepper. And he would say, I'm Professor Morton Salt. And of course, I'm Dr. Pepper. Always wanted it to be fun. He was great with endings, big endings for songs. One day he said, I want to end this song like this. He said, when you're smiling, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles at you and you and you and you and you and, you, and oh yes, and me. Jazz chord. I learned pretty early on that there was this hand that came out. He was playing the saxophone and the hand would come out like this. He didn't think I always needed to know exactly what that was going to happen there. But I just learned that it meant stop, pay attention, something's going to happen. One time, he was singing the Tennessee Waltz. I remember the night and the Tennessee Waltz, and I know just how much I have lost. And he, he kind of folded it on himself, and he began to weep, and he got his handkerchief out. He said, now, just, just a bit, I'll be okay. Just give me a minute. Looked up, said, I think I'm going to get me a dog. Dog doesn't care if you're rich or you're poor. The dog doesn't care if you're smart or you're stupid. Dog doesn't care if you're beautiful or if you're ugly. The dog just waits for you to come home. And as soon as you put that hand on that doorknob, he comes running, wagging his tail behind him because if he was wagging in front of him, he'd be going in reverse. Yes, I lost my little darling the night they were playing the beautiful Tennessee Waltz. 
We like to play uplifting tunes, happy tunes. But one day Ed said, I want to play the blues. I want to play the blues in a nursing home? Ed? Yeah, I want to play the blues. They'll, they'll love it. He said, most people don't know what the blues are. Oh. The blues are a medication for a done gone wrong situation. So we played the blues and he was right. They loved it. But one day I called Ed about a gig, waiting for him to say, let's do it. And there was a pause. He said, I can't come. You can't come? No, can't come. I'm in the box. You're in the box? I'm in the box. I'm in the hospital. Well, you know how it is when you have to get up in the middle of the night and you have to go. And if that happens too often, it can become irritating. Well, if you have to get up in the middle of the night and you have to go, but you can't go, that can become a medical emergency. And Ed was in the hospital. I was there visiting Ed, and he was ready to go. He wanted to get out of the hospital and get on with our nursing home circuit gigs. And the doctor came in, and they began to talk about what it would take for him to be ready to be discharged. And then he said, Mr. Cox, now you know that you have an advanced case of colon cancer. And then we talked about this and, and we've decided not to do surgery and not really to treat it. So it will get worse. And Ed said, I know. Well, that's another thing, which apparently he thought I didn't need to know. But now I was learning, I was learning how much it took for him to do all the things he was doing. I learned that when he got up in the morning on the day of a gig, he immediately had to get into his finery because if he didn't, he wouldn't be able to get his feet into his wingtip shoes, and he did not want to go anywhere without those wingtip shoes. But we kept on going. We kept on playing. Till one day, Ed said, I'm going on a trip. This will be my last trip. He says, I've been all over the world, but I want to go to Trinidad, back to Trinidad where he'd been stationed in the military. His daughter insisted on going with him. He insisted on taking a professional videographer with him to record the occasion. He came back all aglow. He says it was great. He says, everywhere I went, I saw these places I remembered, and they're videoing it, and people would begin to ask, who are you? He said, I told them, I am the man who brought the pan to the land. He, he had to explain to me that pan was the term that the people of Trinidad used for their steel drums, and that he was one of those soldiers who had brought those oil drums and left them behind, out of which the people of Trinidad fashioned those instruments. Well, on a hunch, a few months ago, I Googled Edward Cox Trinidad. And wouldn't you know it? There is a YouTube video. Here is Ed Cox in his 94th year, very slowly making his way to the middle of a stage in a jazz club in Trinidad. White suit, white hat, wingtip shoes, Saxophone hanging around his neck, counting off the tempo of the rhythm section, and playing the blues. Taking a final dose of his self-prescribed medication just a few months before we lost him. Now, I like to play, and my Favorite people to play with are some people who are part of something called a silver club. We have a great time together. I do miss my old duo buddy. But every once in a while, 
It's like he's leaning over my shoulder, whispering in my ear, don't just make music. Make friends. Make fun. And every once in a while, just stop and pay attention. Because something remarkable is apt to happen. And it usually does. Thank you. Yeah. That was so amazing. Uh, Roger Parker, thank you so much. A as you were speaking, it reminded me of something Steve Jobs said as he was dying of pancreatic cancer. He told the 2005 uh, Stanford class of graduates at the commencement address that death is life's change agent. It's the single best invention of life. That's an interesting thing to say, but one thing that we know as we grow older is that we're exposed to more people who then pass away. And one thing that it might do is it, it, it produces almost a shadow of contrast to the life that we have. It brings out life more. It makes life a little more alive. It helps us think about what matters most in our lives. Marcus Aurelius, this famous uh, ancient Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher said, don't live your life as if you're gonna live 10,000 years. While you live, do good. I love that, that we're here for this brief time on this planet. And while we're here for this brief time, maybe we should be doing what Roger Parker's colleague did. And uh, you just start having the biggest life that you possibly can. And why wait until old age, frankly? But um, it's so important. I also want to just say there, there's one thing that came in chat. There's a lot of things coming in chat, which is so cool. Thank you very much for your chat applauses and, and your comments. But Tom Guida said, come on, people, let's get the money rolling in for the $5,000 match. Let's go, guys. Let's keep going and let's keep rolling. Let's knock the socks off of this you know, these old goals that people had. Let's think about this in a whole new way. Let's think about what we could possibly do to make these programs really shine during this time, especially. And one of the programs that is really amazing, really shining is a program that actually my mother and my sister, Chris, um, worked on. They worked in as volunteers for Meals on Wheels. Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels since 1974 has worked to reduce hunger and food insecurity for our inbound, for our homebound adult neighbors in the Ann Arbor area who because of their health are unable to shop and prepare nutritious foods and meals for themselves. So what would your donation pay for? If you're gonna, you, you know, anytime I'm giving a donation, I wanna know what's it gonna cover? Well, older adults need meals just like everybody else does. Okay, so here's what a thousand dollar donation will do. A thousand dollar donation from you will provide 140 hot, nutritious meals to their clients. 140 hot, nutritious meals to their clients. And they cook them. It's really amazing. I mean, the, there are chefs, there are cooks at Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels who do the cooking, and it's very cost effective. $1,000 will provide 140 hot, nutritious meals to clients, and you need meals, you know, to, you, you need meals to be safe, right? So everyone needs meals, but you also need the meals to be safe. So $500 will pay for 40 coolers that would ensure clients' meals stay in food safe temperatures when being delivered. That's nice. Oh, by the way, after you've eaten some of these meals, like any other meal, at some time, you probably have to go to the bathroom, right? Well, guess what? $100 will purchase two months of toilet paper for their clients, for 10 clients. $100 will purchase two months worth of toilet paper for 10 clients and they supply that. So better wash up, right? Well, guess what? $25, if that's all you can afford, fine. $25 will provide a bottle of hand soap for 20 clients. You see how important this is. Any amount of your donation will help these people in Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels. Here's a letter from one of their clients. Dear Meals on Wheels, office members, cooks, and all volunteers, thank you for your hard work during the serious epidemic, this difficult time. You're still delivering food to our home. I get emotional even thinking about this. It's not easy. We appreciate your warm-hearted help. These people need us, they need you. 
please try to be generous. There are three ways to donate. There's a donation link. There is the QR code for your phone and you can just send a check in by mail. Do what you can. Now, by the way, I'm already crying and I haven't even gotten to storyteller number two, Margaret Flannery. She is amazing. COVID-19 caused a lot of our plans to change. And this event is a good example of that, by the way. The day of the time we were supposed to record Margaret, Margaret called in to say she had been exposed to COVID-19 and didn't want to put anyone at risk. Now imagine you've applied and you get accepted, you can tell your story. And she was kind enough to say, look, I know somebody who's been exposed. I was around them. I don't want to expose, I don't want to hurt anybody. That's what this greatest generation does. This greatest generation is really the greatest. We have to support them. So anyway, after we recorded all the other stories, we went to Margaret's home with our video crew and we recorded her story outside in her garden. And Margaret is feeling fine now, thank goodness. And we're delighted to share her story with you. This is a story about a birthday celebration. It's an unexpected kind of birthday celebration, and it's on the other side of the world. So this is storyteller number two, Margaret Flannery, Lake Ra Ra. In 2018, my friend Anita Adhikari invited me to visit her homeland, Nepal. One of the places we were to visit was Lake Ra Ra which is the highest freshwater lake in the Nepali Himalayas. It's about 10,000 feet. I had never heard of Lake Ra Ra, but sure, why not? The day before my 72nd birthday, four of us, Anita, Bina, Sandy, and I, flew in a small plane between the mountaintops to a tiny village, Tulcha. And we landed on one runway with two men out there flagging us in between the mountains. Then began the six hour hike up to Lake Ra Ra. It's a good hike and it's beautiful. It's not terribly steep, it's not rocky, and it's very green. Reminded me of Michigan. And it's, it's totally beautiful, there's no, tea houses, there's no bathrooms, there's no homes, there's nothing there, no McDonald's, just beauty. We arrived at Lake Ra Ra just as the sun was setting. And our guide, Shambo Lama Dong, had made four reservations for us in the only hotel at Lake Ra Ra. And, you know, we each wanted our own room. So there were four reservations and this was the only hotel, and it was definitely not a five-star hotel. It was a no-star hotel. I went to the bathroom through this tiny hallway, and the bathroom was a squatty. And fortunately, it was really dark and no electricity because it was Yucky, it was really, really bad. I went back out to the courtyard and Shambo came and told us something happened to the reservations. There are no reservations in the only hotel. There's no room. There's lots and lots of people in the courtyard and horses and a big bonfire because this is Dashain, a major Nepali holiday. There's no room. And we're going to spend the night in the courtyard with the rest of the Nepali people. I was tired and hot and dirty. We decided to eat and it was served on a plank of wood out in the courtyard with a big pot of dal, which is lentils, and a big pot of rice and hot water. And we took our plates into a small room about big enough for an eight foot wooden table. That's all that's in there. Um, and it's dark and I sit down and start eating and it's good food. Um, and then we notice that the head of the table is a man butchering his goat right there. And by, yeah, it was blood and guts, really yucky. <sighs> 
we went back out to the courtyard and Chambeau said that they had taken pity on the four little old ladies and they were going to give us a tent. And not only a tent, but three blankets and two pillows. And we were very fortunate and very happy not to be in that hotel and in a tent. We crawled into the tent and fell asleep. We were all tired and we were nice and cozy. And along about 1230 at night, I wake up shaking uncontrollably. And we're worried about altitude sickness because that's deadly and we're so high and we're far away from any medical help. My friends started rubbing me and giving me hot water and I was fine. I was just cold. And it's after midnight. And my friends realized it's my 72nd birthday and they sang happy birthday to me. It was wonderful with the moon overlooking Lake Rara. It was great. In the morning, we went back to Tulcha, the tiny village, and stayed with a family in their home. We stayed with Prem and Sita and their two daughters. And Anita told Sita that it was my birthday and that I didn't eat sweets. Later in the afternoon, Sita brings my birthday cake and in the middle is a kerosene candle and plain boiled potatoes. And it's the perfect birthday cake for me. I loved it, it's the best birthday cake ever. And the potatoes called to mind my Irish heritage. Of course I love potatoes, it was great. I love Nepal and I love the Nepali people. And I came back to Michigan last year and began the old lady task of, you know, throwing out the boxes and boxes of junk we have that I have. And I found a vision board, which I had made about 30 years ago. A vision board is a poster board where you put pictures or words or things representing what you want in your life, what you envision for your life. And I had pictures of a bike that these are pictures I tore out of a magazine and something about work and my daughter, who's very special, very special, wonderful daughter. And I like to travel. And so I had, you know, torn out a magazine, a picture to represent travel, just random picture. And there in the right hand corner is a picture of Lake Rara. I was astounded. I was astounded. Remember, I told you I'd never heard of Lake Rara. This was just a picture I tore out of a magazine. And I ended up there. You know, you can dream it, it will happen. Recently, I made a new vision board for myself. And right in the middle of the vision board is a big heart. I think I'm going to fall in love soon. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Margaret, for that beautiful story from around the world. That is so cool. From the other side of the planet. And by the way, I wanted to mention, we just got uh, a message in from a woman named Wen Yu Shi. Wen Yu Shi just uh, texted in saying, here from Shanghai, China. So we have people watching this from all over the world. That is just so awesome. Way to go, guys. Now, here, I'd like to talk just briefly about another program, the Housing Bureau for Seniors. The Housing Bureau for Seniors helps older adults find secure, safe, and stable housing, as well as other services that are necessary to maintain people's health and well-being. Now, what would your donation do to help? $1,000, I'm gonna, this is really important. $1,000 would prevent an eviction from occurring, thereby helping to keep a roof over someone's head. $500 would prevent a utility shutoff and keep lights and AC and heat on. 
$500, $250 donation would assist with moving, with moving trucks to another home. And $50 would provide a cab ride to and from an essential medical appointment. Those are super important. And this housing bureau, man, it's just incredibly important now. Can you imagine? So again, three ways to donate, the donation link, the QR code, and the third one is sending a check-in. So now what I'd like to do is introduce storyteller number three, Mark Holland. Mark Holland is a professional. He is a published playwright whose comedies have been performed more than 300 times in the past 24 years. Mark played Atticus Finch and Willie Loman for the Ann Arbor Civic Theater. This guy is great. And recently he signed a deal to publish a trilogy of mystery novels chronicling the adventures of guess who, Ted Winkle, Private Eye. Digging this so much. So without further ado, Mark Holland, the knees go first. The knees go first. That's what I always heard. In my case, it was actually true. See, uh, the, the cruciate in this knee, meniscus in this knee, and tendonitis in both of them, nagging injuries, really. No different than your aches and pains, right? But the, uh, the implication when they say that the knees go first is that other things are going to start to go. And for me, that was just a little bit higher than my knees. I'll explain. I went through a period of years where I wasn't taking care of my health. And by the time I actually got around to seeing a doctor, I was dealing with some conditions that I couldn't handle with just diet and exercise. So I went from being this guy who takes a couple of Motrin when he's exceptionally sore to taking seven pills every day. I don't have to tell you, any time you take a pill, there's a chance of a side effect, including sex. And that's what happened to me. So, what is the complete last thing you want to do in a situation like that? Talk about it. Yeah. What is the absolute most important thing you could do in a situation like this? Also talk about it. Now, I'm not saying you should get up in front of the whole world like this, do it the way I'm doing it. That might be an unusual choice. I'll admit that. I started with my doctor. Perhaps you should, too. So I told my doctor, and by the way, if your doctor doesn't want to talk about your sexual health because you're over the age of 50, get another doctor. I talked to my doctor and told her about the side effects that I was experiencing. And she said, are you interested in sex? And I said, yes, I'm interested in sex. I'm also interested in origami. And I can't do that either. <laughs> so we discussed it. And, and these, these pills that I was on, this, this toxic brew, the thing is, is that overall, they were working pretty good. So the, the, the agreement that we made was that we would stick with these for a little while, give them a chance to maybe even out a little bit. So this left things up to my wife and I and our creativity. So I talked to my wife about it. And she reminded me that we'd already changed our approach to bedroom activities when she was going through menopause. Well, now see, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. Comparing my situation to her situation. Where was my wisdom? Aren't we, you know, are we always telling the young kids, let's work smarter, not harder. But finally, my wisdom came in the form of an old story. A story about two bulls up on a hill. Two bulls, an old bull and a young bull. Young bull looks down into the pasture and says, I'm going to run down there and mate with one of those cows. And he's gone. The old bull watches him go and says, I'm going to walk down and mate with all of those cows. <laughs> Wisdom. That's wisdom. What am I in such a hurry about? What are any of us in such a worry about? I'll tell you. We tend to get into a pattern, don't we? There's a step one and a step two and step three. And even though there may be variations, our expectations don't change. But what if it's not step one, step two, step three? What if it's just step one? 
What if it's just step two? What if it's one, two? What if it's two, three? What if it's one, three? Who cares? Who cares? For us, we had to remember that on the other side of that door was no one waiting for their dinner. There was no one waiting for help with their homework. Our time was our own. And here is your worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is you spent time in the arms of somebody you care about. Cares about you, hopefully for a long time. Now, conversely, if it's been a long time since we got to step three, it can happen very quickly. And then we just look at each other and we smile and say, well, hey, we're not getting paid by the hour. <laughs> See, we got to have a sense of humor about it. We have to. Even though we're more skilled at many things, few of our parts work as well as they used to. So, yes, my problem was a little above my knees, but the solution was a little above my shoulders. Because your brain, your brain is the most important sexual organ. Use your creativity. Be patient. Have a sense of humor. Talk about it, and you can get through this and still feel like a complete person. You know, for me, what I had to do for myself and for my marriage was to take charge of my physical, my mental, and my sexual health. And I feel better. Even getting up here today and talking about it was cathartic. But I have to ask you. Was it good for you? Thank you. Wow. Wow. I am blushing. That was an amazing, amazing story, Mark Holland. Thank you so much. The needs do go first, but boy, uh, that is so relevant. Thank you for providing that. Thank you for opening that story up and for being so vulner vulnerable in that, because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking along very similar lines. Really appreciate that. So I'm an educator. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. Most of my students are in their 20s or, you know, maybe in their 30s. And I've always wondered, why does education have to stop there? Why don't we have lifelong education? I feel like I want to be a lifelong student, but I also need uh, somebody to help me with that. I need some sort of lifelong learning. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, or OLLI, O L L I, provides stimulating meaningful and high quality educational lectures and study groups for older adults who are 50 and older. And they're designed by older adults. I've spoken to them before. I love speaking to this group. They're stimulating and they're stimulated. They are totally into the things that I have to teach them and share with them. And I always learn just as much, if not more, from them than I have to teach them. I think this is a really super important concept philosophy, as well as program. So please, please think about your donation going to this as one of the programs as well in these amazing big hearts for uh, seniors program. So what would your donation pay for? I always ask. Well, $1,000 would provide a senior residence with, all, with access to all of Ollie's closed caption recorded lectures for one year. That's cheap. Imagine how much tuition at the University of Michigan costs. That is so inexpensive and it's providing so much for a person for a whole year. $500 gives three members access to their Thursday lecture series. I think I've spoken in a couple of those. I love that. $250 provides a member with the opportunity to go to two educational day trips. That's wonderful. And especially when people can get together, that's going to be so relevant. $50, if that's all you can provide, that's fine. Provide what you can. But $50 will provide an annual membership for 10 lectures in Ollie's Distinguished Lecture Series. Talk about lifelong learning. And then finally, $25 provides a member with an annual membership fee. $25. Maybe multiply that by 10. Maybe multiply that by 100. See how many people, older adults, you could give an annual membership fee to so they could be part of this lifelong learning that we all so deserve and need, frankly. In March of this year, Ali had to transition all of their programming to online. 
That is not trivial. I know that for a fact. And they had to do it within just a few weeks and they did it. They did it. They provided lifelong connection and continued stimulation during COVID-19. These are brave hearts. These people are amazing people. They are innovative. They're incredibly hardworking. They're very serious professionals and they take their profession and what they do extremely seriously. And we really do deserve to give them some money. We give a lot of other things to a lot of other programs. Let's think about what we could do for these older adults and for these amazing programs like Ollie. So now let me introduce storyteller number four. Storyteller number four is Carolyn Rose. When I saw this, it was so beautiful and so fun. Carolyn Rose is a retired nurse who now works with people living with dementia. I'm sure all of us know some people who have dementia or some degree of memory loss. And uh, she uses the power of song to reach them and to make a connection. So with that, Carolyn Rose Stone singing with strangers. Let's see if you remember this one. Dum, 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 de do a do be a yay, whoa, 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 only the lonely, only the lonely. That's Roy Orbison, his first big hit, 1960. And I was in junior high when I heard it, and I misheard the words a little bit because I thought he's some, finally written a song for an only child. And I was an only child. I sat at a table with my father and me and my mother, who was a compulsive talker. She couldn't control her talking, and she did it all her life. I would hastily eat, and my dad would too, and we would split, and he'd go to his newspaper, and I'd go to my room to play Golden Records. And in my room, I would sing to the girl in the mirror, and I would sing to my dog, and if it was summer, I would might go outside and sing to the honeybees in the clover. My dad loved music too, and on a Saturday morning, when my mother would go off to Safeway, we would listen to his music, his favorite and his favorite was Hank Williams. But I had heard my mother tell him in no uncertain terms, you cannot play Hank Williams in this house because he is a drunk. That's how it sounded. So my poor father had to wait until she was gone and then he'd pull it out and we'd play the sad songs first, which would be like Cole Cole Heart and Walking the Floor Over You. And then the happy song was always Hey Good Looking. And one Saturday, he was stretched out in the lounge chair, and I'm on our itchy green couch, and he did something totally different. He jumped up, and he said, Carolyn Rose, let's dance. And I said, yeah, sure. And I'm a little girl, so he's bent over like this, and he's dancing with me with a swing step, and he twirls me around, and then he picks me up just like that. And I'm right here in front of him. And he is saying, hey, hey, you're good looking. Mm -mm, what? what you got cooking. And I took that to mean everything's going to be all right. In high school, in 11th grade, I made a big decision. I decided that I wouldn't talk to adults for the whole school year. So I stopped talking. I stopped talking. All I wanted was someone to listen to me, to ask me, what's wrong? And no one did. In, in adulthood, I got married and I went to college and my husband and I were Bob Dylan addicts. We loved all his songs. And we would learn all the lyrics and sing along. And then I went out and got bold and bought myself an acoustic guitar. And I learned how to play by listening to Peter, Paul, and Mary. Their chords were pretty easy. And we'd get it out when we could sing something that I could play. And sooner or later, it sort of got left in the case. A little more, a little more. And then one year, it was in the back of the closet. And then maybe a decade, and it was in the yard sale. Things like that in adulthood happen. You know, you drop things like that. 
I slowly stopped singing. It slipped away. I didn't even realize it. But later in my years closer to retirement, I had friends who invited me to come sing with them. And they had been singing for years, and it felt like heaven. I had my own harmony. We were having fun. And it was the key that unlocked that locked door. And now I've sung with him 15 years. One fall, I was walking over to my bus stop on Packard, and there was a woman's voice really loud coming down the street. And I looked, and she was coming toward me and singing loudly, and she was singing opera. Opera, Italian opera, right there on Packard Avenue in in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It seemed so strange, and I thought, is that legal? You think? But then I thought, I want to do that. I want to be able not to sing opera, but to be able to not worry about what people thought of my voice anymore. Not at all. And right on the heels of that, looking at retirement, I said, I am going to saturate my life with music. And it was not a goal. It was a commitment. And I've kept it. One day I had to catch an A-ride cab, and um, the radio was on when I was in there, and it was Roy Orbison again. And he was singing In Dreams, that tragic song, you know, strong, tragic voice. And his voice hit me like a sonic boom. And I hadn't heard his voice in 50 years, and that emotion was right there, the same. That's what music can do. And I told the driver how much I love the song, and he said, I do too. I missed all those old guys, and I took that to mean the dead guys, the music, music, musicians who were dead. And we started naming them off. We got a long list going. I got Janis Joplin in there and Buddy Holly. And we were laughing, and I said, well, you sound like you're a musician. You seem to know a lot. And he said, ah, I do. I, I play my little Stratocaster. I, I do, and I sing. And I said, oh, were you ever in a band? And there was a little pause, and he said, yeah, I was with two friends, and we sang gigs for 30 years. And then he told me that they had fallen out, and in, apparently it was something terrible, because he said, I can't go back. And those four words were like this, like the sonic boom. I knew what that meant. So before we were done, we were singing together one of the band's old songs, and he started it. I didn't even have to say it. Here we go. Up on Cripple Creek, she sends me. If I spring a leak, she mends me. And that was wonderful. Harmony, I was singing low harmony. He was melody. We sang all four verses of that thing, and we did two choruses at the bottom. And I even got the woo-woos in from Levon Helm, you know. I got them all in. It was wonderful. And I got out to say goodbye, and I said, you know, you might want to think about looking for someone to play with you since you said you don't really have anyone with you. And he said, you're right. You're right. I want to see you again. And I said, well, I want to see you again, too, because that's the best cab ride I've ever had. And that was the truth. My mind, my precious mind, is a jukebox. And I will never, ever turn it off again. Thank you. Wow, wow. I could listen to Carolyn Rose's beautiful Southern accent and her singing all evening. What a beautiful, natural storyteller. It was wonderful. Now, remember when I said that Carolyn Rose works with uh, people with dementia? The Silver Club Memory Programs, one of our big Hearts for Senior programs, provides socialization and engaging activities for individuals who have mild to moderate memory loss. 
while they also provide respite for their families. How important is that? If you're a caregiver of a person with moderate dementia, that can be a half time to a full time job, literally 20 to 30 hours a week, just taking care of that person. Silver Club Memory Programs helps with that. I'm not sure there's anything that could be more important. And so they're now providing daily free virtual programming, a virtual support group for caregivers and telephone support and referral services for to, to send people to the right resources. So what could your $1,000 pay for? Now you still have $1,000 left, right? So if you have $1,000 that's available, that would provide transportation for 10 outings, such as the University of Michigan Museum or the Mathai Botanical Gardens. There's certain things that you can maybe still do even with COVID-19 and they're gonna work on that. So, and then when, when you know we can start hanging out together a little bit more, imagine the kinds of outings that they could have and what $1,000 could do, 10 of these outings. $500 will give 25 families one-on-one -on -one emotional support and a link to resources from the Silver Club staff. $500, that's not much for what that would do. 25 families, one-on-one -on -one emotional support. $250 would provide six months of art supplies for members to express themselves creatively. My wife is an artist and she's been an art therapist in the past and I know how important, I know the value of art and being creative uh, for people who are caregivers for people who are going through issues like memory loss or dementia, super important. So $250 provides six months of art supplies for people. $100 provides five potential new members a free hour of activities and socialization, five new members. And $50, if that's all you have, that's fine. If $50 will give one month of breakfast for members. $50, one month of breakfast. That's breaking it out. You can do the math yourself. That's not a lot for every breakfast. They make your dollar work really, really hard. Every dollar you put into this is gonna work really hard. I promise you that. Now, let me introduce storyteller number five. We have six storytellers. We're on storyteller number five. This is one of my favorites, Betty Brown Chappelle. Betty is a retired professor and she's a 2012 Martin Luther King humanitarian. She has an amazing background and boy, her talk just blew me away. She introduces us to a remarkable woman, her grandmother, Ada May, who despite her tiny stature and her humble, humble beginnings, as you'll learn about, left a massive legacy. Said Betty Brown Chappelle, the matriarch. This is my grandmother, Ada Mae Woodson. As you can tell from that picture, she's a fun-loving person. She dressed up in these men's clothes at a carnival. She had a postcard taken and she sent it out to family. Something that some of us may have done ourselves is play dress up for a little fun. She lived to 97 years of age. Despite the fact that she smoked pal mel unfiltered most of her life. Now we called her Big Mama. She came about there to me when she had on her orthopedic shoes. At her fighting weight, she's maybe 130 pounds. Life for Big Mama, unfortunately, was not always a crystal stair. Her um, birthday, July 4th, 1888, two, two and a little bit uh, decades past emancipation. But we celebrated the 4th for her and we celebrated it for the nation. But at seven years age, she and two of her sisters were unfortunately found by a police officer in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was born across the river in Owenton, Kentucky, but they didn't have a facility for children there. And he took these three daughters, these three sisters to the Cincinnati House of Refuge, which you all might know as a poorhouse. She stayed there 
until she was 14 years of age. At 14, she went to work for the Stafford family. And how that happened is the Stafford family chose her from a group of children. They took the children from the House of Refuge across the river to the courthouse. The children are lined up, infants to teens, and then the families walk by to see if they want to take one home. Ada May, we want you. What they wanted her for, they wanted her to take care of their three children. So she's almost a child, really, at 14, I was a child. She's a child, and she's now responsible for three other children. She's sleeping in a closet every night, and someone in that household tried to molest her. And I suspect out of desperation, she met a man casually around Owen County somehow, and his name was James Garfield Brown. They got married instantly. I know why he married her. At that point in her life, she was stunning. And then at 15, she had the first of eight children. Seven survived. Now, unfortunately, Papa Brown was not a particularly good husband. He sometimes, I think, used the money in ways that shouldn't have been used with all those kids. And worst of all, he abused her physically. And the last straw for her was when he broke her collarbone. He moved away very quickly, and his sons by then are, are older, and they protected their mother. While he's away, she's making her way in the world, but then he dies. And at that point, her life gets a few crystal stairs. The sons rehab what I now know of as an auto repair shop for their mother to have a home. Now, I don't know as a child that this is formally an auto repair shop. I just know that when we go to visit her, my dad says, all right, you kids, sit still. Don't touch anything. Don't break anything. And be quiet. Don't you fight. I don't want to hear any mess out of you. And we did exactly what he said. But we figured, boy, she's rich. She has to be rich because all of the things we have to do just to visit this precious home. No. It, and now I realize it was a rehabbed auto repair shop because you had to almost take your life in your hands, just put your foot on the floor at night to go to the bathroom because it was so cold, especially in the winter. You almost stick to the floor. But as time went on and she met a gentleman, his name was Thomas Metcalf. She met a gentleman and they fell in love. They were on the train. He was a cook and she was a passenger. And there's a glorious picture of the two of them together. She's standing in a white dress, floor length, off the shoulder, and he's got his arm around her, and they are at a bachelor and Benedict party. So she has a partner, and they made that little house larger so they could have larger gatherings because the family is growing and growing and growing. She also has card parties. I know this because I have a picture of people laughing and playing cards. She's gardening and she has a little dog. And so life is pretty good for her. But I thought to myself when I recall her, I said, how in the world did she manage to nurture all of those people when she's almost a child herself? Well, there are a number of things that she did. We talked about her being fun-loving, so she had fun with me. I played 
pick up sticks with her. And then another cousin, Gwen, she said, you know, Big Mama got down on the floor with me in her late 70s, maybe 80s, and played jacks. And not only did she get down on the floor with me, she enjoyed it. She's laughing and she loved to crochet. And she even tried to teach me, but I am all thumbs, couldn't do it. Uh, we have in our family some of the artifacts of her crochet work. She uh, loved television, and she loved tea, and she loved cigarettes. So she's watching television, and I'm sitting beside her. She puts that cigarette down. She puts the teacup down because she is watching wrestling. Gorgeous George, <laughs> platinum shoulder length hair in the late 50s, okay? And he's getting ready to wrestle and the bell rings and she's like, get him, hit him, kick him. And so I learned from that and I think her family did have a good time. And we also learned how to be frugal. So she's frugal because my mom said, A to make and make a dollar holler. She's frugal, but generous. So she, there wasn't a child that she didn't turn down when they asked for money. But how is she getting that money? We're learning hard work from her because I remember seeing her walk miles to the job and from the job. And she's a laundress. It's not so easy when you've got to wring the clothes out with a wringer and when you have to use a scrub board and get all those spots out, right? So those dollars came hard. And I remembered that when she sent me $50 in cash in an envelope and it's addressed to Dear Better because she cannot spell Betty. Now, when I think of her, I think how amazing there are about 300 people that are her descendants and we are military officers, we are laborers, we are secretaries, we are bus drivers, we are a university professor, university administrators, we have elected official, we have a lawyer, and we have an individual who was the director of HR for the Western Hemisphere of a Fortune 500 company. And that lawyer became an aide, a legal aide to Hillary Clinton. And I'm thinking we wouldn't be able to walk these paths without Ada May. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Betty. And a toast to Ada May. I so wish I could have met her. So much vitality, amazing woman. Uh, that that was so inspiring to me when I first uh, listened to it, and it was even more today. Thank you. Our fifth Big Hearts program that I wanted to talk about out of these five amazing uh, Big Hearts programs is the Turner Senior Wellness Program. Now, I am a professor in a school of public health, and my profession is dealing with wellness and well-being. The Turner Senior Wellness Program promotes quality of life, vitality, which Ada May clearly had tons of, and well-being among older adults. It's such a big challenge and yet so unbelievably important. What could your donation pay for? What could $1,000 pay for? $1,000 could pay for an entire movement and dance series for those clients who have Parkinson's disease. They have a movement and dance program, a series 
for people who have Parkinson's disease. They have all sorts of other movement and yoga types of classes. They have a meditation class and they move them all online. Uh, but $1,000 will pay for this entire series. $500 will support a season of healthy living presentations, just $500. $250 will provide one year of enhanced fitness classes for an individual. $250, you can start taking fitness classes. And by the way, it's super important to be taking these fitness classes as you grow older, incredibly important. And that's what this Turner Wellness Program does. $50 provides a caregiver consultation. And we all know that caregivers are key, critical, to the physical and mental and emotional health of older adults. $25, if that's what you have, great. It'll pay for eight meals for an older adult, $25. If you send $25, eight meals. If you send you know, 10 times that much, 80 meals, not bad. Maybe provide 800 meals for people. I'd love to see you do that. We are getting so many donations pouring in right now, and it's because of all of you. This is a community that's incredibly important to these older adults who are in the greatest need right now. And now it is my true pleasure to introduce Brita Miller. She is one of the artistic directors of Big Hearts. She was on the selection panel to choose tonight's amazing storytellers. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did and coached them along with the other artistic director, Brian Cox. She coached the storytellers to become as effective as they could be given the circumstances that we were in. Brita is a speaker and an author of an award-winning book, The Caregiver Coffee Break. Boy, is that important. She also created a video of her Ticket to Heaven story, which went viral in early 2020, and it has reached now over a million views. So she's the real deal. This is really big. Her story tonight is when an apple pie is just more than a pie. So our sixth and final storyteller of the night, here is Brita Miller, the apple pie. I was my mother's caregiver, but sometimes I really got it wrong. My mom lived with us and she took her last breath in her own bed in her favorite sheets. My mom didn't have Alzheimer's disease, but she had congestive heart failure, which led to vascular dementia. So her dementia would come and go. And when she was in the fog, it was so hard. <sighs> My mom wasn't always like this, though. She was this sparkly little Irish lady with big green eyes who had a penchant for sprinkling Estee Lauder's youth dew as if it were holy water. She and my dad emigrated from Ireland with and raised her family, four sons, and me, the only daughter. Now, my mom wasn't a great cook or anything fancy, but she could bake. She. Uh, she could bake scones and soda bread with her eyes closed, and her brown bread was legend. But it was her pie, her apple pie, that was her claim to fame. She, she had these magic fingers that she could take, I don't know, a scoop of flour and a stick of butter and just make this beautiful, delicate, flaky pastry that was always a mystery to me. When she would bake, an amazing thing happened. The neighbors would just kind of show up at the side door just at precisely the right moment, especially Mr. Gillespie, for a slice of pie. And when she became a U.S. citizen, her big decision was to add cinnamon to the recipe to make it an all-American apple pie. This was a big deal. My mom was also very particular about her tea, and she schooled me in the proper way to make a pot of tea. You had to have a full rolling boil and pour the boiling water into the squatty teapot, swoosh it around, and then dump it out before you make the actual pot of tea. A tea cozy was necessary to keep it warm, and she always said that tea just tasted better in a nice china cup. So it was, it was so hard to watch her decline as she became more ill. She was such a, a feisty little lady. She was, she was that lady that you would see that would be out walking three miles a day with her little white Reeboks on. And now 
Now at this point, she could, her balance, she lost her balance and she could barely take a step without gripping onto her walker for dear life, which meant she couldn't do many of the essential things by herself that she loved to do. The day that she said to me that she realized that she could no longer make herself a cup of tea, she said, I'm useless, Eustace. And it was, it was so sad. So we called hospice to help us, and they were fabulous. When we learned that mom, mom's time with us was, was near the end, we, called, we decided we would have a gathering of my brothers who lived in other states who would come to our house and that we would have a party to celebrate mom. And, uh, you know, in theory, it's a good idea. Yeah, except the truth is, I would now not only have to take care of mom, but I would also have to take care of them, feed and entertain them. And in this rickety old farmhouse that we had, which, you know, three teenagers in various stages of immaturity, two dogs, a husband who worked midnights, I have a pesky day job with an office in my home so that I could care for mom 24 seven, who's 85 with dementia, and we're gonna have a big party. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, my brothers were really excited to come up and for everybody to be together. And my brother Donna called mom to say how he was looking forward to seeing her and that he couldn't wait for a piece of her delicious apple pie. And that was when things went south. From that moment on, she never stopped. Are we making the apple pie? The boys love my pie, you know. We, we ha can we make apple pie today? Every day, all day long, for weeks. That's all I heard. Apple pie? Is today the day we're making apple pie? Now, I have to tell you, I did not inherit my mother's magic fingers, the gift for pastry. I've tried, I, and it has not ended well, no. Usually, it, it's like a gray mass of something sticky and very salty, you know, from the tears. And um, I, I would get in such a, such, a, such a tizzy about this that my kids know what a conniption looks like. Not good, not good. So I called my brother. What were you thinking? Don't you know what you have unleashed? You know, you're talking about the pie. That's all she's talking about. I got to make the pie. I got to make the pie. The boys love my pie. You know she can't make a pie anymore. That means I have to make the pie, and I don't do pie. And he said, Brita, don't worry. I'll call her. I'll bring a pie. It'll be fine. So, you know, that calmed her down for a bit. And the day of the party rolls around, and she starts in with, is it time for the pie? And at that precise moment, my brother walks in with a pie in a cardboard box with a clear plastic cellophane window at the top and the word Kroger printed on the side. And to add insult to injury, a big orange sticker that said half off. My mother was appalled. She wouldn't even take a single bite of this store Bosch pie. And my brother thinking he's gonna make it better says, oh, but mom, it's good. It tastes just like your pie. <laughs> yeah. She might have dementia, but she knows apple pie. <sighs> anyway, we were able to divert her and avoid pie gate, and uh, it all ended well. So they all left, and I was wiped out. The next day, I'm packing away her good china, and I hear it again. Are we making the apple pie? Are we, uh, apple pie, the boys love my apple pie. And I want to scream and say, Mom, we already had the party. We don't have to make the apple pie. It's okay. But she was obsessed. And every day she was asking about this apple pie all the time. I'm loading the washer and I hear the rumble of the walker down the hallway. And I know what's coming next. And I hear, apple pie, did you get the good apples, the Granny Smiths? Apple, this would be apple pie is great. 
I think I'm going to lose my mind. I am the poster child of a stressed out, burned out, exhausted caregiver. I can't take it anymore. If I hear the word apple pie one more time, I'm going over the edge. And at this point, I realized that for the first time in my life, I need professional help. If this goes on, I could go before her. So I find it the name of a counselor. I call, I make an appointment. And he says, so tell me why you've come. <laughs> and I just let it go. I tell him how exhausted I am, how stressed out I am, how I'm not sleeping at night, how I have so much to do, and how hard it is to take care of everybody. And my mother is obsessed with making an apple pie. And there's no need to make the apple pie because my brothers have already been here. And I'm not good with pie. I don't like, I don't even like pie. And I don't know, I'm going to lose my mind. And he's such a good listener. And I knew he was going to be supportive. And he was going to say, you know, you're right. Boundaries are good things. We have to set limits. You know, you, you, you're right. But he puts down his pan his pen and his pad of paper, he leans forward and he says, Frida, you got to make the damn pie. What? I know, I know, you're busy, you got a lot to do, but just pick a date on the calendar, write it down, tell your mother you're going to make the pie, get the ingredients, and then just do it. You won't regret it. So I get all the ingredients, I lay them out on the counter, I put an apron on me and one on mom. And then I hand her the paring knife that she's always loved. And she starts to peel the apple. Now my mother did not believe in apple peelers. And even though she really struggled to do it, I remembered, she, well, the look in her eyes, she was just in her glory. She used to be able to peel an apple in one unbroken curly ribbon of peel. And it reminded me of how when I was a little girl, she would curl my long brown hair with those magic fingers into ringlets or banana curls with big bobby pins and set them that way. So she couldn't really peel the apple. So I finished peeling all the apples and then slicing them according to her directions Mary Kelly would not be rushed. We put them in the big mixing bowl with the right spices. I gave her the wooden spoon so she could give it a couple of good stirs, which she did. And then we had the dough, the dreaded pastry. And she gave me really specific instructions and I did my best. I had the big old rolling pin and I'm rolling it back and forth and sideways and whacking it and she's giving it a whack and there's flour everywhere. I mean, it was on the counter, on the floor, on, on, on the dough and all over me. I looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I got it to an acceptable thickness and wrestled it into the pie plate and then we had to arrange the slices just so. And as we were doing that, our hands touched. And I remembered how she used to tell me when I was practicing my Irish step dancing to point my toe just so and hold my arms loosely at my sides as she had been taught in Ireland. We put the lid on the pie crust and I used that little knife and trimmed the edges all around. And she asked for a scrap of dough and the knife again. And then she cut out three little leaves in the pastry and told me to place them right in the center of the pie crust. So I did. We put it in the oven and when it was done, presented the pie on the table in front of her. And the look on her face was something. She was able to eat a few bites of pie along with nice cup of tea in her china cup. And she said to me, this is the best pie I've ever made. And you know, I felt so ashamed. How could I have been so clueless to be so focused on 
all the, the caregiver things, all the things that I thought were so important of organizing and keeping the train running and doing all the stuff that I missed the most important thing of all. And I was so grateful to be called out before it was too late. Because, you know, it was never about the pie. It was about making the pie. And on that afternoon, I got such a wonderful gift. I stopped being her caregiver, and I was able to be Mary Kelly's daughter. Thank you. Wow, that was so amazing, <laughs> Brita. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it put tears in my eyes. Um, and I want to thank you, Brita, and I want to thank all of the other team for putting together this amazing group of storytellers. You know, it, it, putting together some type of event like this, a giving event, was not simple when it moved online and no one knew exactly, you know, we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants. And uh, also things were changing all the time. So it's kind of like putting airplane wings on an airplane while it's still flying. It wasn't simple at all. Um, but but Brita and the rest of the team, the leaders of these uh, Big Hearts for Seniors programs really uh, wanted to tackle this. And I'm so impressed with them and what they've done. They are real heroes to me. Um, you know, we're all going through a, a very tough time right now. We all feel a lot of stress from this pandemic every day. Some people feel a lot more stress than others. The people who we're trying to give our donations to uh, feel stress that's so much more difficult. Can you imagine what some of them are going through right now? Seniors who are essentially locked up and quarantined, who are scared that if they get this virus, that they'll die from it. Um, that's a very different experience than many of us. People who can't see others, you know, we can't see our, our senior adult friends and loved ones. It's really, really difficult for everybody. But the question right now, as we're closing up right now, is can we become purposeful in this pandemic? Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, right? You remember him? Jonas Salk, by the way, was a researcher, guess where? At the University of Michigan. He was a researcher right in our School of Public Health. And here's what he said a little later in our lives, in his life. He said, our responsibility is to be good ancestors. Our responsibility is to be good ancestors. Betty Brown Chappelle's grandmother, Ada May, was a good ancestor. Brita's mother was a good ancestor. Can we look back and say that we were good ancestors? We'll look back and say these people that we're supporting are good ancestors, but let's take ourselves out 10 years from now, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. Let's go to our grandchildren and their children and their children, maybe even 200 years from now. Will they be able to look back at us and say, they were good ancestors. The people in this community right now in this meeting, are you gonna be a good ancestor? Because a big part of being a good ancestor is being purposeful and focusing your attention and your goals on the things that matter most. These senior adults are the people, the things that matter most, among many things. We have other things that matter a lot, too, and that's wonderful, and we should be giving to that. But boy, I'm not sure I can imagine a better place to start donating your money. It's so important right now. So let's be good ancestors. Maybe if you can give what you can. Maybe if you can even rethink and re-give a new donation as well. Maybe if you've already given a donation, you can go to the silent auction and get something really cool and maybe overpay for it. Won't that be cool too? Because you'll feel so good about that thing that you got. And there are some amazing things in the silent auction. So I'd just like to close this by thanking everyone who created this. Um, they did an amazing job. And in particular, I wanna thank all of you for being here, for being so generous and so kind-hearted to this Big Hearts for Seniors program. Thank you so much.
I lost my dad two years ago and he was a pastor and one of the things he taught me since I was little is his phrase was, you never lose by giving. And I think one of the things that's kept me going after losing him is living on a legacy that he taught me and that is giving and serving people every day. I think it's an honor and I think to be able to provide care and love people in some of the moments where they need you the most and they feel the darkest is pretty much the best thing you can do with your life. One of the reasons I opened Memory Lane is from seeing how things were in the industry and the places that I had worked previously and I knew that in all the places I had worked I would never want to put my mom there. I just felt like this is not right. This is something that cannot be allowed to happen and you know if I wouldn't want my mom there then why would I want someone else's family there? I thought you know what we're missing a need here in the community. There are people where home care is not an option for them because they can't stay at home or they can't afford home care because it is actually more expensive than living in a facility. And we need to be able to provide something where people have an option to go and live, but in a place that they would want to live, in a place that they would have quality of life to live, that they could still live their best life, that they could still have choices. They could still get up when they want not be forced to get up at a time when the person who's caring for them has to get them up because they have eight to ten other people to care for and they have to get them up in a certain order. I have seen people wait hours just to use the bathroom before and obviously they don't make it in time. That is just something that I would never ever want for my own family. So when I opened Memory Lane and I made decisions based on the care I thought if my mom was here, would I want this person working here? Would I want, you know, how many people would I want one person caring for if they were also caring for my mom? Or if I was making the food, would my mom like this food? You know, that kind of stuff. And that's really where the concept of Memory Lane came from. I am incredibly proud of Memory Lane and the thing that I'm most proud of is that when our residents walk in the door and they come to live here, I commit to the families that I'm going to treat them just as I would my own family. And I honor that commitment with everything inside me. I fight for them just like I would my own mom. And I'm proud at the end of the day that I can leave knowing that they're going to get just as good of care when I'm here as when I'm not here and I make sure that they're happy for as long as they're with us. No matter where they're at in their illness or what happens, they're always going to be my family here at Memory Lane.